there. Aha. Okay, very good. <laughs> okay, good. So, uh, welcome back again. And uh, if you'd like to ask some questions before we carry on, we can do that. Yeah, there you are. Okay. Please. <laughs> Thank you, Bande. Yeah. Um, with regards to killing, yeah. what is your opinion on pest control business? Pest control business? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, it is killing here. Uh, yeah. Uh, and so I think uh, ideally one should avi uh, avoid that kind of livelihood. Any livelihood which involves the killing of living beings uh, is considered wrong livelihood. It's actually in the suttas. Uh, uh, so um, ideally you avoid that. So I, I know there's a famous story with uh, Ajahn Shah, Ajahn Brahm's teacher. Uh, there was one of his supporters was a fisherman. You know that story? Huh? Yeah. yeah? <laughs> okay. And there's, there's two stories. One of the, sto the stories was a story, I don't know if which one you've heard, but one of the stories was the fisherman said, oh yeah, but I just, I just pulled the fish out of the water, yeah, and the fish dies by itself. Uh, but that's not kind of good enough excuse. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I was... But but Sorry. So, but the, but the other one, this, the story that really I wanted to get to was the idea that uh, uh, Ajahn Shah said to him that uh, you know this is your livelihood. Uh, you have to look after your family, of course, and all these things. You have uh, certain obligations in that area, so you try to find a new livelihood. Uh, but in the meantime, you, you have to look after your family, so you have to kind of carry on with these things. Uh. So it is the same thing, I think, with uh, pest control. Uh, you know, you have to kind of meet your obligations to some extent, but you also try to get out of of these things because. Because it is, in the end, you are killing living beings, uh, and uh, it's uh, not not a ideal way of pursuing your Buddhist life. Yeah, I was talking to this friend, and yeah. uh, he's in he's doing accounts. So he says he's not killing; he's just doing accounts. But he's this in this company. I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I I think I in that kind of situation I think ideally you you don't want to support that sort of business ideally but the further removed you are from the actual killing the less bad it is yeah so if you're just doing the accounts it's not such a bad thing it's almost like eating meat is eating meat is it bad or not uh, you are, it's almost like you are taking a little bit part in the killing but you're actually far removed and the Buddha said it's no problem so I think in that situation. Uh, Probably not ideal, uh, but also I don't think it's a very, very, very uh, blameworthy in that sort of context because you're just doing the accounting uh, for the company. Uh. The person doing the killing is the one who usually has to bear the brunt of the problem. Uh. Yeah, one more question. Yeah. Um, uh, you were saying about giving alms to beggars just <laughs> earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have a syndicate all around town. Knowing that the beggar is part of the syndicate, do you still give alms to him? Yeah, in that case, I, I would say don't do it, uh, because you know that you're just giving to some kind of crooked organization. Uh, mm. But if you think it's a real beggar, someone who really is needed, then you can, it's better to give. Uh, it's like when you go to Bodh Gaya in India as well, and you have these syndicates coming mm. around, and they uh, actually abuse people to make them look like real beggars, mm. uh, which is terrible. So then you are supporting the, mm. almost the abuse of people uh, in that sense. So I would say no, in that case, if you know that it is a crooked business, for, of course, forget about it. Uh, but if you think that it is the real thing, then it's good to, uh, good okay. to do so, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yes, please. <laughs> Ajahn, yeah. you mentioned uh, this morning that uh, Buddha do not encourage supernatural performances. Yeah. Well, there's a story about a Buddha doing the twin miracles. So oh, yeah. is that true or not true? <laughs> the twin miracles is found in the commentaries. So well, in the sutta, it's not mentioned. Of no, the there's twin not miracles. mentioned in the suttas at all of twin miracles. Uh, it's found in the commentary. Very, uh, I think commentary to the Abhidhamma in various places. Uh, I think after he came down, his connection with can't even remember. One was in Savati, I think. Uh, um, Sorry? In his father's hometown, Kapilavastu. Kapilavastu. Uh, yeah, Kapila the, 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 the yeah I think there's a couple of places. When, when he went back to his hometown? Yeah, it's mentioned in a couple of places, I think. Yeah, I think it's mentioned maybe there as well. Uh, but th this is all from the commentaries, uh, not actually in the suttas. Uh, so there's no, th there's no reliable evidence that it ever did those things. So. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I forgot. Yeah, I've got no, one no. more question. That's so okay. sorry. Yeah. Um, this is regarding gifts. You will, yeah. you touch on the subject just now. Yeah. If somebody gave you a gift which you know um, you will not use it, it's not useful to you. Do you reject the gift? 
It's interesting. I, I know that Ajahn Brahm used to tell a story. I, it, it probably has told this story here as well. This was a story of the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama, he was traveling around Tibet and he was receiving gifts from everyone, even though the Dalai Lama obviously was well off and all these people were really poor, yeah, and he probably didn't need any of that. Uh, and then the pinnacle of this story, there was a journalist traveling along, a uh, Western journalist, Western journalist, very critical, yeah, very cool. And, <laughs> and so this um, Dalai Lama, there was a poor girl, yeah, and she didn't have anything to give away except a skirt. Yeah, and, and it was a skirt, so he also received the skirt. At this point, this Western journalist, he had had enough, he had seen all this kind of giving. He said to the Dalai Lama, what? How can you receive? You don't need a skirt. Yeah, this is a poor girl. That's all she, all she has in her life is kind of, she needs the clothes that she has. Eh? How can you receive a skirt from this girl? Eh? And the Dalai Lama answered, it's not that I need it, it's that she needed to give her. Yeah, and it's a kind of beautiful thing because uh, you you realize that giving is often is is about much more than the immediate material things. It's about your spiritual development. And if, if she gives with a good heart, with a pure heart, uh, then it will give her enormous spiritual uplift, which is far more valuable uh, than any material requisite that you have. Uh, yeah. So uh, so giving can very often be a it can be a source of some, something beautiful. So if someone gives to you, uh, and if it is something you don't need, uh, well, you can always give it on to someone else who does need it. Uh, yeah. What happens if the person who gives you something that you're supposed to consume, and <laughs> then after that, two weeks later, the other person asks you, "How was the effect? Did you take it?" <laughs> How was the thing? Okay. Uh, and but you don't want to eat it because you because what because of your, your illness or, or something like that or because oh, of because you don't believe. In it. You don't believe in it. Cons yeah. You don't believe in consuming it. Uh. No, no, no. Because uh. I don't believe in that product that the guy gave. Ah, I see. Oh, it's like a, a me medicinal product or something like that. Uh. Okay. Uh. Um. <laughs> it's very tricky sometimes, right? Uh, you, uh, yeah. I, sometimes you just don't, don't know what to do. You, you maybe you kind of make an excuse. Uh, you said, "Oh, I haven't really, I haven't done it yet," or I, I, I maybe you can find some kind of excuse. Uh, sometimes it might even be best to say uh, no thanks, uh, you know, at initially, if in, in difficult situations like that, and say, oh, you know, I don't actually, uh, it is not the kind of product I would use, I have my own way of dealing with this, or, or something like that, uh, which doesn't kind of reject the gift out of hand, uh, but it just says that you, it's not really, for, not really for you. So find a nice way of saying no thank you without rejecting the person completely. Uh. I will quote you on that next time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, life is full of tricky, tricky little things. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get really unpopular now, is that right? <laughs> okay. Anyone else like to ask anything? Yeah. Anyone else okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. So, uh, we're here. Yeah. Okay, so let us continue. And we have just been looking at uh, King Pasenadi losing his grandmother. And having looked at that, we're going to have a look at another sutta, which also has to do with death. And uh, this is a simile, is one of the perhaps one of the strongest similes in the suttas about dying. And this is why one of the reasons why I like this sutta. You, m many of you will have heard this sutta before because I. I, uh, I, use, I often bring this sutta out for, for this kind of retreats. Uh. Anyway, this is how it goes. Uh. At Savati, then in the middle of the day, King Pasenadi of Kosala approached the Blessed One. Uh. The Blessed One said to him as he was sitting to one side, uh, Now where are you coming from, great king, in the middle of the day? Just now, Venerable Sir, I've been, I have been engaged in those affairs of kingship, typical for head-anointed Katya kings who are intoxicated with the intoxication of power, who are obsessed by greed for sensual pleasures, who have attained stable control in the country, who rule having conquered a great large amount of land. That's what it basically means. So here, the uh, the king has kind of done the things of kings 
And of course, the important point here is this idea that he says that he is intoxicated. Yeah, when you become powerful, intoxication with sovereignty is like you become very powerful. Yeah? And when you become powerful and you have a lot of access to the pleasures of the world, uh, you get intoxicated by these things. Uh, these things, you lose your sense of what is right and wrong. You lose your sense of what is appropriate, uh, and you start doing silly things because of the power and the access to pleasures that you that you have. Uh, so this is an important thing to remember that in Buddhism, the idea of being intoxicated or deluded uh, uh, has many sources. Uh, yeah, it's not just uh, kind of the usual things of being deluded by alcohol or whatever, but it can come from many different sources uh, that we are intoxicated. Uh. And that's when problems arise, when you lose your sense of perspective. The Buddha replies to him, What do you think, great king? Uh, here a man would come to you from the East, one who is trustworthy and reliable. Uh, having approached you, he would t tell you, For sure, great king, you should know this. Uh, I am coming from the East, and there I saw a great mountain, uh, high as the cloud, coming this way, crushing all living beings. Uh, do whatever you think should be done, great king. Then a second man would come from the west, a third man would come from the north, and a fourth man would come from the south, one who is trustworthy and reliable. Having approached, he would tell you, For sure, great king, you should know this. I am coming from the south, and there I saw a great mountain, high as the clouds, coming this way, crushing all living beings. What do you think should be done, great king? Do whatever you think should be done, great king. If, great king, such a great peril should arise, such a terrible destruction of human life, the human life being so difficult to obtain, what should be done? And the king replies, If, venerable sir, such a great peril should arise, such a terrible destruction of human life, the human life being so difficult to obtain, what else should be done but to live by the Dhamma, to live righteously, and to do wholesome and meritorious deeds? And then the Buddha replies, I inform you, great king, I announce to you, great king, old age and death are rolling in on you. When old age and death are rolling in on you, great king, what should be done? And of course, the uh, he says the same thing, as all age and death are rolling in on me, venerable sir, what else should be done but to live by the Dhamma, to live righteously, and to do wholesome and meritorious deeds. So here the Buddha gives this beautiful simile of the idea of old age and death, which are like four large mountains crushing everything, coming from the four directions. And you will see that there's, there's no mention of how far away those mountains are. You don't know how far away they are. Maybe just coming around the corner up the street down here. Huh? Yeah, Big boom, boom. <laughs> yeah, you have to make it real. It's not just in the street. You have to make it real. A big mountain. What is the biggest mountain in Malaysia? Kota Kinabalu. Huh? Kota Kinabalu is coming this way. Yeah, four thousand meters tall, crushing everything. Boom, boom, boom. Something like that. Huh? And uh, it's a very powerful image. There you are sitting, waiting for this mountain to crush you. That mountain is old age and death. Yeah, you know it's going to come. You don't know when. It could be just around the corner. And this is, so this is just, a, again, a reminder to all of us that uh, uh, when uh, you don't know when death is going to come, and because we don't know, we always have to be prepared. The only time we can be prepared for death is now. There is no other time to be prepared. How do you prepare for that? And this is exactly what it says here. It's by doing what is wholesome and doing what is good. The beautiful thing about uh, reminding ourselves of death is precisely that we understand that there is no, we can't take any chances. Yeah, there's no time to do anything bad. There's no opportunity for that. Why? Because next, you, know, you don't know what's going to happen next. And because of that, it now is the opportunity to do what is right and to live well. So death has this ability to clarify things for us, to remove the intoxication, to make sure what really matters in the world, that we get our priorities right. And this is the beautiful thing about the, uh, 
uh, death contemplation. Uh, all the nonsense gets put to one side uh, and we focus on what actually matters. Uh, we can't afford not to be friendly with people. We can't afford to have enemies. Uh, yeah, because as long as you have enemies, then you, you have a problem. You've got to rid of, get rid of those problems. Uh, and the chance to do that is now, straight away. Uh, there's no waiting for the, in the future, uh, for the future to come. Uh. So this is the beauty of uh, death contemplation. It just makes it so clear what matters in life. Uh, and um, so this is what the Buddha is saying. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later on, uh, but I think I will not go into, into any more detail at this particular point. Um, and then uh, King Pasenadi, he says to the Buddha, there are, venerable sir, elephant battles fought by head-anointed Katya kings uh, who are intoxicated with the intoxication of power, uh, who are obsessed by greed for sensual pleasures, uh, who have attained stable control in their country and who rule having conquered a large amount of land. But there is no place for those elephant battles, uh, no scope for them, when old age and death are rolling in. What's the point of getting into these battles, doing many stupid things, uh, when age and death can be just around the corner? Especially if you go into battle, uh, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, that might be it. There are, Venerable Sir, cavalry battles fought by head-anointed Katya kings. Uh, there are chariot battles, uh, infantry battles, uh, but there is no place for those infantry battles, no scope for them uh, when old age and death are rolling in. In this royal court, Venerable Sir, there are counsellors uh, who, when, they, when the enemies arrive, are capable of dividing them by subterfuge. But there is no place for those battles of subterfuge. It's like tricking them, basically. No scope for them when old age and death are rolling in. In this royal court, Venerable Sir, there exists abundant bullion and gold stored in vaults and depositories. And with such wealth we are capable of mollifying the enemies when they come. But there is no place for those battles of wealth no scope for them when old age are rolling, all age and death are rolling in. As all age and death are rolling in on me, venerable sir, what else should be done but to live by the Dhamma, to live righteously, and to do wholesome and meritorious deeds? So it is, great king, so it is. As old age and death are rolling in on you, what else should be done but to live by the Dhamma, to live righteously, and to do wholesome and meritorious deeds? So, uh, there you are, a little sutta on death with a memorable simile of the great mountains. Uh, I remember when I read this first time myself, it made a big impact on me, this particular sutta, because the simile is so powerful. And by the way, I should mention here that uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi has translated uh, as aging, and the Pali word is jara, and jara really means old age. It doesn't actually mean aging. So, um, just to be clear about that. Uh, Okay, let us go on to the next one. This is uh, the seven Jatilas. Jatilas were ascetics in ancient India. Uh, and uh, so this sutta is about these ascetics. Still continuing with uh, King uh, Pasenadi of Kosala. On one occasion the Blessed One was dwelling at Savati in the Eastern Park, in the mansion of Megara's mother. Now, on that occasion, in the evening, the Blessed One had emerged uh, from seclusion and was sitting by the outer gateway. Then King Pasenadi of Kosala approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, and sat down to one side. So Megara's mother, that's uh, Visaka, so this is Visaka's mansion that she had, been, she had given to uh, the Sangha. Uh, and this was one of uh, several monasteries in Savati. We've already seen Anathapindika's park, and this is another one, the Eastern Park, or the better perhaps Eastern Monastery. The word Arama means both monastery and park, and uh, so the, what happened was that often the parks in the country were owned privately by people, and then they were given to the Sangha when they became uh, Buddhists or whatever. Uh, 
So these parks were very suitable places to have monasteries because you could build, because you had open areas uh, and all that kind of stuff. Uh. Now on that occasion, seven Jatilas, seven Nigantas, these are the Jains, yeah, or the Jains, uh, seven naked ascetic, seven one-robed ascetics, and seven wanderers uh, with hairy armpits, <laughs> long fingernails, uh, and long body hairs, uh, carrying their bundles of requisites, uh, passed by not far from the Blessed One. Uh. Then King Pasenadi of Kosala rose from his seat, uh, arranged his upper robe over one shoulder, knelt down with his knee on the ground, and raised his joined hands in reverential salutation towards the seven Jatilas, the seven Nigantas, the seven ascetics, naked ascetics, the seven one-robed ascetics, and the seven wanderers. And he announced his name three times. I am king. I am the king, venerable sir, Pasenadi of Kosala. I am the king, venerable sirs, Pasenadi of Kosala. So, yeah, well, one of the nice things here, we can see the idea of Anjali. Anjali goes back to ancient India, goes back to even before the time of the Buddha. This is a standard way of saluting someone when you, either out of respect or, be, or because, simply because you, you want to be friendly to someone in particular here. So this is a very ancient thing here. And putting your right knee on the ground, that's almost like you're going to ask for someone to get mar marry you or something. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> So, uh, anyway, that's what they also did in those days, if you respected someone. Huh? So these ascetics here are just different kinds of ascetics. You can see in ancient India there were so many different types of religions and teachings. Yeah? Uh, you had these Jatilas that were fire worshippers, you had the Jains or Jains who were uh, existed in India probably prior to Buddhism, uh, and there were often naked ascetics, and there were other naked ascetics, uh, and uh, so all of these various types of ascetics were wandering around, uh, and they were all kind of fighting for the attention of the lay people, yeah, and trying to kind of uh, proclaim their doctrines, and some of them did, did, this, did it because of fame and money and power, uh, whereas others were more sincere in the spiritual search. Uh, but it was a very interesting time in ancient India, very uh, very kind of uh, uh, full of ideas and uh, ideas were encouraged and people were actually interested in spiritual matters uh, and they were all about spirituality, all about becoming happy and finding an end to problems in life. This is what it was all about. So it was a very interesting time in ancient India and the, 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 the religions they had then were in many ways uh, just as interesting as the religions we have now, maybe even more interesting. Uh, and uh, much more debate and much more harmony, perhaps, between the religions than there is now, when there seems to be more strife and problems often. Uh, anyway, then, uh, not long after those seven Jatilas and seven wanderers and etc. etc. Et had departed, uh, King Pasenadi of Kosala approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side and said to the Blessed One, uh, um, Okay, yeah. Uh, those venerable sirs are to be included among the men in the world who are arahants or, or who have entered upon the path to arahantship. Okay, so do you think that's true? All of these uh, ascetics, are they all arahants? No. <laughs> yes, I think that's a very wise guess of you right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good guess, right? Okay. So this is what the Buddha replies to him. Great king, being a layman who enjoys sensual pleasures, dwelling in a home crowded with children, enjoying the use of Cassian sandalwood, wearing garland scents and, and cosmetics, receiving gold and silver, it is difficult for you to know these are arahants. These have entered upon the path to arahantship. And this is what I was saying before, is that I, for it is generally very difficult to be absolutely sure whether someone is an arahant or not. Uh, it can be difficult enough to know whether someone is a, uh, you know, is a stream mentor, has good samadhi, all of these things can be hard. Sometimes the very best we can do is to see whether someone has good morals, uh, that we can see. Whether someone is ethical is not so impossible. But all of these other things are very, very hard to, to tell. 
One way of telling this uh, is to uh, you know, look at how people live and if they live very simply uh, yeah, with very few possessions and they live maybe far away in the jungle or whatever uh, but they still have a lot of happiness uh, and that is a sign that they have something inside of them that is very rich and creates that happiness for them. Uh. Yeah, if you took an ordinary person uh, in the world and stuck them in a tiny little hut in the forest uh, they wouldn't be happy, yeah? they would be miserable. My family, my possessions, everything, help, get me out of here. That's what they would say. But uh, So if you are able to live like that and still be happy, in fact, not only happy, but more happy than people in general, uh, it is a sign that you have some inner wealth or inner happiness that other people don't have. Some samadhi, perhaps some insight uh, that others have. Uh. But apart from that, it is, uh, it is difficult because your uh, uh, when you live with sensual pleasures, your idea, you cannot really grasp fully what it means to live without that and to live in the jungle. People think it is really hard to live in the jungle by yourself, but actually, if you have the right kind of meditation, it is not that hard. And that's why people in the jungle are even more happy than you are, uh, or not you are, than <laughs> anyone is in, uh, in lay life usually. Uh. So, what does uh, Nanda Buddha carry on? Uh? It is by living together with someone, great king, uh, that his virtue is to be known, and that after a long time, not after a short time, uh, by one who is attentive, not by one who is inattentive, uh, by one who is wise, not by a dullard. So, how do you know someone's virtue, uh, and in other words, their morality? Uh, and uh, it's so easy, again, to even simple things like this, we have to be very careful to pass judgment too quickly. Huh? Very easy to judge someone quickly. Huh? But actually, according to this, we should take, wait a long time before we judge anyone. Huh? It doesn't say it's wrong to judge people. It just says that when we judge, we should do it with care. That is what it's saying. Huh? And not judge finally, but just have some idea of whether they are virtuous or not. Huh? So you have to observe, you have to be careful, you have to kind of keep on looking. Uh, and then after a while you start to gain de a degree of confidence in the person. Everyone can kind of, uh, you know, play act for a while. Uh, but in the long run you will know roughly what people are up to and what they are doing. Uh. Yeah, so it is hard to know these things. Uh, after a long time, not after a short time, by one who is attentive. You have to have manasikara, you have to attend to this person. Uh. You you have to be wise. Yeah, this is kind of scary, isn't it? You have to be wise to be able to figure these things out. You can't be kind of stupid or, or unwise or foolish or whatever. You have to have a degree of wisdom with you as well to be able to see these things. And uh, that is perhaps the hardest part because sometimes it's very difficult to know whether you are wise or not. Are you wise? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, what, the one wise one down here, okay. <laughs> so you just use your wisdom to the best of your ability, huh? but uh, you know, things, your views will change on these matters uh, as, you, uh, uh, as you hopefully become wiser and practice more. Huh? Is it too cold for people? Are you alright? Huh? Yeah? Are you okay? Huh? Are you sure? Yeah? <laughs> okay. Okay, good. Please let us know because we want everyone to be healthy. Yeah? Many days to go, so we want the health to be. Max, max out on the good health, uh, so nobody actually gets sick here. Yeah. So these are important things to remember, uh, that actually it is hard to judge other people and we should do so with care. But uh, it is not wrong to pass some degree of judgment. Uh, in fact, you have to. We have to make decisions in life about who to trust, who not to trust, uh, about who to uh, accept as a teacher, who not to accept as a teacher. And we need to make these choices to the best of our ability. So it's not wrong, it's just that we need to be careful in doing so. Huh? It is by dealing with someone, great king, that their honesty or their purity is to be known. And that after a long time, not after a short time. By one who is attentive, not by one who is inattentive. By one who is wise, not by a dullard. And uh, the dealing here is like business dealings. Yeah, After a while you get your trusted business partners that you trust uh, and uh, the others that you don't trust uh, and you stay away from those. This is basically what this is uh, about. Uh. It is in adversities, great king, that the person's uh, fortitude or endurance uh, is to be known. 
And again, that after a long time, not after a short time, by one who is attentive, not by one who is inattentive, by one who is wise, not by a dullard. It is by discussion with someone, great king, that their wisdom is to be known, and that after a long time, not after a short time, by one who is attentive, not by one who is inattentive, by one who is wise, not by a dullard or by a fool. So this is how you come to know people. It's very useful advice to remember in your own life. Uh, these things, uh, to be careful and circumspect in how we evaluate and look at the people around us. Uh, yeah, and to give people the chance. One of the things is also to remember that people can change. So if you do judge someone a little bit or you think of them as immoral, don't make it an absolute judgment. Uh, remember that suddenly Immoral people become moral. Moral people become immoral. So you, you, uh, one of the things, if you decide that someone is a bad person, sometimes it's like you can imprison them into that role because you have decided that they are bad. So don't imprison people. Allow people to evolve. Allow your attitude or your view about others to change, so that you, uh, uh, so that they are given the chance of actually becoming better people. Very often how we look at others, that's how they tend to become. Yeah? If we decide that someone is bad and we treat them as a bad person, sometimes they live up to that and they become bad because we look at them with bad eyes. But if we treat someone well and we see the good qualities in them, then very often people will live up to those good qualities and they become better simply because we look at them in a positive way. We tend to be affected by how people look at us. If people look at us in the bad, we think, yeah, what, you know, whatever. What, uh, you know, who cares? Yeah, they, they already think I'm bad, some others will be bad perhaps. Yeah, there's no incentive almost to be good if someone has decided that you are bad. But whereas some, if someone decides that you are good, then you have an incentive to actually try to live up to that trust that other people give you. So actually looking at people's good sides, seeing them with kindness, with metta and all of these things, actually it is a gift to other people and it helps them to become better. We are encouraging them to live life better and to make progress on the Buddhist path. So it's a wonderful thing to do that and of course that is what metta, metta is all about. Metta is all about seeing the good qualities in the people around us. So it's a great little piece of advice there from the Buddha. And then King Basenadi replies, It is wonderful, Venerable Sir, it is amazing, Venerable Sir, how well this has been stated by the Blessed One. And then he adds, These Venerable Sirs, they are my spies, my undercover agents, coming back after spying out the country. First information is gathered by them, and afterwards I will make them disclose it. <laughs> Now, Venerable Sir, when they have washed off the dust and dirt and are freshly bathed and groomed with the hair and beards trimmed, clad in white garments, they will enjoy themselves supplied and endowed with the five kinds of sensual pleasures. So much for those ascetics who were arahants. <laughs> so there, there you are. So, that's, uh, yeah. so the Buddha, he, he, uh, he always replies, in an appropriate way, and so there, uh, <laughs> there you are. Uh. Okay, uh, let us move on to the next little sutta, uh, and this next one is uh, uh, one of my favorite little suttas. Again, uh, all of these are my favorite suttas. Actually, every every sutta is my favorite sutta. That's the problem. Uh. <laughs> But this is a uh, particularly nice one. It has a lot. It says a lot about the Dhamma uh, and the way it works. And it's one of those suttas I also like to read out on pretty much every retreat I do because of the important message in the sutta. The sutta is called diligence, apamada, or heedfulness, if you if you like. Yeah. Again, at savati, sitting to one side, King Pasenadi of Kosala said to the Blessed One. Here, Venerable Sir, while I was alone in seclusion, the following inflection arose in my mind. In other words, I thought like this. The Dhamma has been well expounded by the Blessed One, and that is for one with good friends, good companions, good comrades, not for one with bad friends, bad companions, bad comrades. 
So it is, great king. So it is. The Dhamma has been well expounded by me. And that is for one with good friends, good companions, good comrades. Not for one with bad friends, bad companions and bad comrades. So here, the word for good friends is Kalyana Mitta. Yeah, this uh, very actually very important word in the suttas, uh, and the bad friends is Papa Mitta. Papa means like bad, bad friends. Pap, I think they say in Thailand, if I, if I know correctly. And so these are the bad ones. So you want to have good friends uh, according to this. Uh, so the Dhamma has been well expanded by the Blessed One, but only for one with good friends. So that is when it works. So why is that the case? And this says something about the importance of good friends, yeah? That the Dhamma is really only for one with good friends. So this is the, what the Buddha has to say about this. On one occasion, a great king, I was living among the Sakyans, where there is a town of the Sakyan called Nagaraka. Then uh, the Bhikkhu Ananda approached me, paid homage to me, sat down to one side and said, Venerable sir, this is half of the holy life. That is good friendship, good companionship, good comradeship. This is uh, a quote from another sutta. This is actually from the uh, Maha Nidana Sutta in the Diga Nikaya number 15. That is where that happens. And Venerable Ananda approaches the Buddha and says this. Uh, yeah, good companionship, the Kalyanamitta, is half of the holy life. And many of you know the answer to this already, especially if you read on, but don't read on, stop, stop yourself from reading on, because then you know the answer. <laughs> so, uh, uh, this is interesting, for those of you who already know the answer, uh, there's not, no need for you to say anything, but what do you think? Is that, does that make sense? Is it half the whole life? Is it, is it, no, it's not half the whole life. Is it more than half or less than half? Are you sure? Are you, how do you know? <laughs> How can you be so sure? Okay, so to me it sounds a bit too much, yeah, because how can it be half the whole life? What about all the other things we have to do? What about virtue? What about compassion? What about meditation? Is that, doesn't that count? How can Kalanamitta be all the whole life? It's a good question, isn't it? Uh, so I, that's what I was thinking. I think, yeah, Ananda, he must be exaggerating. Yeah, half, no way, it can be half the holy life. But this is what is so interesting, because sometimes the Buddha says things that goes against our normal views, the no, how we normally think about things. Uh, and that is when it makes you think about you know, the Dhamma in a deeper way. Uh, and this is exactly what is going on here. You already you think Ananda is exaggerating, but actually it turns out he's not exaggerating at all. He's underestimating the importance of good friendship. Uh, when this was said, Great King, I told the Bhikkhu Ananda, not so, Ananda, not so. This is the entire holy life, Ananda. That is good friendship, good companionship, good comradeship. It is the entire holy life. So what does that mean? Does that mean that you, you, you can just come to these gatherings and just hang out with good friends? Is that what it means? Maybe that's what it means, yeah, you come out here, hang out, whoa, this is so nice. You can stay, have a cup of coffee, read a few suttas together. <laughs> actually, I think I will, I will do that, actually, this is, this is good. <laughs> and uh, to understand the meaning of this, uh, you have to understand how the Dhamma works in a deeper way. When I read this, I thought, I thought the Buddha was exaggerating. How can you say it's 100% of the holy life? But then when you, the more you know about the Dhamma, the more you understand this actually is true. And there is a, a number of suttas. One of the suttas that actually touches on this uh, is a sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya Tens. And in that sutta, the Buddha looks at all the causes for awakening. Yeah, the sutta is not in here uh, because I have to have some suttas. I have to hold back a little bit. Otherwise, I can't be a teacher. Yeah? I can't give you everything. So I hold back a little bit. <laughs> this, is kind of, this is one of the tricks of being a teacher. Then you kind of. <laughs> I'm being very naughty. I apologize. So. <laughs> So you can read the sutta yourself. It's in Anguttara Tens number 61 if you want to read it later on. But in this sutta, the Buddha starts with awakening. Here, and then he asks, what is the cause for awakening here? Yeah? And then uh, he says the cause for awakening is the uh, seven factors of awakening. Yeah? The Sat Sattasambhojanga. This is the cause for Vijja and Vimutti. 
And then he asks, what is the cause for the seven bojangas? And this, that's the four satyabhatanas. What is the cause for that? Then he goes back and back and back and traces cause after cause all the way to the very beginning. What is the root cause for, you know, ultimately the root cause for all of these things to happen? I'm not going to go through the sutta. It's a long sutta. It's very beautiful. Uh, and then the root cause for all of these things to happen is, guess what? Kalyanamitta. That is the root cause. Everything else happens only because of that. And that is why Kalanamitta is 100% of the holy life. Because without it, the path can't even get started. With it, if you do it enough, if you do enough Kalanamitta, yeah, if you hang out with enough Kalanamittas, especially the Buddha, eventually these things will happen almost automatically. Why? Because you get brainwashed by the Buddha. Yeah, and that's basically true. But remember that brainwashing is not bad, yeah, because you get brainwashed anyway. If you don't get brainwashed by the Buddha, you get brainwashed by someone else. Yeah, the Christians come and brainwash you. They say, oh yeah, believe in God, yeah, blah blah blah. Or they or, or an atheist, yeah, non free thinker say, Oh, don't believe in anything, just do what do what I say or do what uh, you know, do what the government says or whatever, and then you'll be happy. So regardless, we are brainwashed. And the reason we are brainwashed is because of the Buddhist idea of non-self. When there is a self, when there is an entity inside of you that is independent of external things, then maybe there is a degree of freedom. But because what we are as human beings, we are just these five aggregates that are conditioned always by external phenomena, it means that whatever we are in the present moment is the sum of all the things that have conditioned us in this life and also in the past. That is what we are. And because we are that, we are 100% brainwashed all the time. Do you feel 100% brainwashed? It doesn't feel like that, yeah? It feels like I have free will. I can do whatever I want. I can choose this religion. I can choose that one. I can choose to come here. You couldn't choose to come here, yeah? You just came like a robot. Like, <laughs> like, a, like a white, like a sheep. Bah! You came along and bang, there you are. That's the reality of it. Same thing with me. I didn't have any choice either. I had to come here for whatever reason. And this is kind of the, uh, how the Dhamma really works. We are conditioned phenomena. So what we have to make sure, and this is kind of the critical part, we have to make sure that we choose good brainwashing. If you choose bad brainwashing, you will suffer. You choose good brainwashing, then you uh, will be heading in the right direction. And that's why I said to people that it's good if you are just a white sheep, all the white sheep, they kind of go together in the flock, yeah? Everyone goes in the same direction, bah, and then move on from one mountain to the next one, and they eat the same grass. Much better to be the black sheep. Yeah. Do you, because the black sheep is the one that thinks for itself, yeah? The black sheep is the one that's kind of slightly on the outside of the group, yeah? Nobody really wants to deal with the black sheep. Black sheep is more independent. Uh, so be a black sheep. Yeah, this is what I say to people. Black sheep are good, especially when it comes to when it comes to Dhamma practice, because it means you have a little bit of independence. You don't just follow along blindly what everyone else in the world does. And this is where the idea of Kalyanamitta comes in. When the Buddha comes along, you listen to the Buddha. And then if the Buddha has some good advice, you change your view accordingly and you allow yourself to be brainwashed by the good brainwashing. Yeah, if you're a little bit of a black sheep, it means you aren't so caught up in all the views and things of the world uh, because you have a little bit more independence. Uh, so I am, I'm a black sheep, you know that? Uh, yeah, I'm a really black sheep. When I became a monk, my father said to me, where did we go wrong in the upbringing? <laughs> That's what he said. Uh, <laughs> and I said, yeah, whatever. That's what I said. Uh, <laughs> Because what can you say to that sort of thing? You can't say anything to that sort of thing. So uh, you decide to just, okay, relax, chill. Yeah? You, you know that this, is, this too will pass. And so you gradually, gradually, you follow what you know is, what you think is right. You, you never know, maybe, but you think it is right. And of course, gradually, your parents come around as well. Yeah? And they realize you're actually doing something really positive. Uh, so being, uh, this is why Kalanamitta is so important, because we are conditioned. We are, so, we, are, we are the sum total of the things that work on us. So this is why it matters. When the Buddha doesn't arise in the world, if there is no condition or circumstances to 
uh, push you in the right direction, there is no hope. There's, you can't really get out of samsara unless you become a, a, become a Buddha yourself, but the chances of becoming Buddha are so remote that uh, there's no really point in trying to do that. So, uh, because of that, the Buddha arrives in the world. Then that opens up the possibility of having a real Kalyanamitta. The real Kalyanamitta is the Buddha, of course. He is the number one Kalyanamitta. And then things start to happen as a consequence. And uh, there is a beautiful simile in that sutta. Maybe I can just mention that simile now because uh, it is a very nice one. And uh, in that sutta, this is uh, I'm talking about Anguttara Nikaya 1061, that I, where, where the simile of the uh, Kalyanamitta being the root cause comes from. Uh, and in that sutta, it says it is simile is it's just like a mountain, uh, and on that mountain it rains. Uh, and it keeps on raining. Yeah, the rain is like the foundation for all of these things to happen. And as it rains and rains and rains, the rain f forms into little streams. And as the streams go down the mountain, the streams go into little lakes. As the little lakes overflow, they go into the large lakes. As the large lakes overflow, they go into the large rivers. And eventually, the large rivers, they flow all the way to the ocean. In the same way, as you uh, keep on here in the Dhamma, as you keep on hanging out with the Kalyanamitta, in particular the Buddha, remember the Buddha is number one Kalyanamitta, yeah? not anyone else. As you do that, and you keep the rain coming, that means you keep on reading the suttas, you keep on investigating this, you keep on practicing a little bit accordingly to see if it works, but you keep on doing it. All you have to do is allow the rain to keep coming. Keep coming! More, read more, try to understand more deeply. Read the sutta again, the same sutta again, again and again. Ten times, twenty times. Yeah, and each time it will sink in a little bit more deeply. Make sure you enjoy it, however. Don't force yourself, because then it's no longer a Kalyanamitta. A Kalyanamitta is someone it's fun to hang out with. That's why they're a good friend. So enjoy it at the same time. Make it something interesting. Keep the rain coming, year in, year out. And as you do so, it starts to flow. The rivers become larger and larger and larger. And eventually, you end up in Nibbana as a consequence. So, it's quite easy. Yeah? <laughs> in a sense, it's quite easy. Uh, but uh, it, it creates, it needs that commitment to the Dhamma, the commitment to understanding the suttas, uh, the commitment to doing this in the right way. Uh, and as you do that, this starts to happen. This is why Kalanamitta is a hundred percent of the holy life. Uh. So there you are, it's a beautiful little thing and it says so much about the Buddhist teachings. It says so much about non-self, it says so much about causality. Causality is just the flip side of non-self. Because if there is no self, then everything is causality. Everything is to do with cause and conditions and the results of those cause and conditions. So um, that is why it is 100% of the whole alive. So let us um, carry on a little bit. When, uh, so he says, no, it is the entire holy life. Yeah? And then the Buddha says, when a bhikkhu has a good friend, a good companion, a good uh, uh, comrade, it is to be expected that he will develop and cultivate the noble eightfold path. Why is that? And the reason for that is because at the beginning of the noble eightfold path is a right view. Right view is precisely what the Kalyanamitta gives you, so right view gets established. Once right view is in place, all the other factors of the Noble Eightfold Path happen as a consequence of right view. It is the first factor, all the other ones they arise because of that. So Kalyanamitta is uh, the person who gives you that right view. Yeah, the Buddha is the eye of the world, the one who sees what is going on. So then you cultivate the Noble Eightfold Path. And how Ananda does a bhikkhu who has a good friend, a good companion, good comrade develop and cultivate the Noble Eightfold Path? Here Ananda, a bhikkhu, develops right view, which is based upon seclusion, dispassion and cessation, maturing in release. He develops right aim or intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right stillness, which is based upon seclusion, dispassion, cessation, and maturing in release. 
It is in this way, Ananda, that the bhikkhu, who has a good friend, a good companion, a good comrade, develops and cultivates the Noble Eightfold Path. So I shall not go into too much detail on what this means, but basically the meaning of this based upon seclusion, it just means that uh, you do this uh, ideally in solitude, yeah, develop the Noble Eightfold Path, based on uh, uh, dispassion and cessation, or it can be mean based on fading away and cessation. <coughs> and uh, that means that uh, as you develop the path, uh, you know, meditation practice, things start to fade away, things get simplified. Yeah, you meditate, your body fades away, your senses start to fade away. The more things fade away, the more you are developed in the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, maturing in release, means that when all of these factors eventually come together, you get released from suffering, released from samsara. That's just in brief what this is referring to here. So that is the development of that Noble Eightfold Path, and it happens because of Kalyana Mitta. By the following method too, Ananda, uh, it may be understood how the entire holy life is good friendship, good companionship, good comradeship. By relying upon me as a good friend, Ananda, beings subject to birth are freed from birth. Beings subject to old age are freed from old age. Beings subject to illness are freed from illness. Beings subject to death are freed from death. Beings subject to sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair are freed from all these things. By this method, Ananda, it may be understood uh, how the entire holy life is good friendship, good companionship, good comradeship. So there the Buddha is specifically saying that he is the good friend, yeah, by relying upon me. Uh, and by relying upon him, you get everything uh, you ever wanted. Uh, and all those uh, terrible things that happen in our life, they don't happen anymore. Uh. Therefore, great king, you should train yourself thus. I will be one who has good friends, good companions, good comrades. It is in such a way that you should train yourself. So, uh, this is quite nice, yeah? You should train yourself in this way, you should make sure you have good comrades. Remember this in your own life, how important it is to have this good companionship. Don't, please don't underestimate it. Every time you come, you read the word of the Buddha a little bit, you get a little bit brainwashed. And it's a good brainwashing, yeah? This is the good brainwashing here. So allow yourself, as long as that brainwashing feels good to you, then car carry on with it. And remember that uh, in in daily life, it is so easy to lose your bearings a little bit, uh, to lose your sense of direction, to lose uh, your ability to be kind all the time and to avoid the bad things. Uh, and whenever you feel that you, avoid, you are losing your bearings a little bit, come back to the Dhamma, come back to listen to a nice discourse, read a little bit for yourself, do something which reignites that feeling inside of having to practice in the right way. We need this all the time to be reminded. It is so easy to lose this feeling in ordinary life and this is the biggest obstacle for people for making progress in the Dhamma that you forget basically you forget the simplest and most basic things yeah, when you are really busy you forget to be kind sometimes even yeah you, 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 you lose it in your heart you don't know how to do it anymore because somehow the busyness of ordinary life drowns out the Dhamma drowns out those things that are actually really significant so please always come back to this uh, root source, the root source that makes everything else possible. If Even if all you do uh, in your spiritual life is just listen to Dhamma talks occasionally, that will have a good effect on you. Uh, every time you hear the Dhamma, you automatically feel more kind inside. Uh, you automatically feel more gentle. Uh, and because of that, you will be kinder and gentler in your daily life, uh, even by listening to a discourse. Uh, and then you take it gradually, stage by stage, and you take it further. Uh, but this is the foundation upon which everything else is built. When, great king, you have good friends, good companions, good comrades, uh, you should dwell with one thing for support, uh, diligence or heedfulness in wholesome or good, good qualities. Uh, yeah, so the, 
uh, heedfulness and good qualities just means that you do your very best to do good things. That's really all it means. Yeah, so you do your very best to be kind, to be gentle, to be generous, uh, <coughs> to help the people around you, all of that sort of stuff. When, great king, you are dwelling diligently, with diligence for support, your retinue of harem women will think thus. The king dwells diligently, with diligence for support. Come now, let us also dwell diligently, with diligence for support. So the people who live with you, your f family members, you could say, in this particular case, yeah, they are inspired by your conduct. And of course, the more uh, authoritative your position is, uh, if you are a leader in the community, uh, then that will have much more power uh, for on the people around you. We influence each other, uh, and each one of us, we have much more power than we think sometimes. Uh, people look at you and they think, wow, what a beautiful example she or he is, uh, and I would like to live in a similar kind of way. And we get inspired by that when we see good examples in our lives. Uh, so remember that, when you're kind, it's not just for yourself. You become an example to the people around you as well. If you are a parent, you are a tremendous example for your children. Yeah? For children, it is far more important how we live than what we say to them. So if you want to be really kind to your children, be an example to them, and then they will learn what is right, at least eventually, at least hopefully. Sometimes you don't know what's going to happen, but often it happens. When, great king, you are diligent, dwelling diligent with diligence for support, your retinue of Katya vassals, uh, in other words, all the lesser Katya kings yeah, around you, will think thus. The king dwells diligently uh, with diligence for support. Come now, let us also dwell diligently with diligence for support. Your subjects, in other words, all the people in your country, in towns and countryside, will think thus. The king dwells diligently with diligence for support. Come now, let us also dwell diligently with diligence for support. You can see the effect here, especially for a king, how everyone in the country is affected by how the king is. And this is one of the reasons why it is so important in our world that we have good leaders in our world. Leaders who lead by example, leaders who actually do the right thing. And uh, some, if you look around the world, some of the leaders are, are really good people, and some of them are not so good. Uh, yeah, you, you look around and you, sometimes you want to close your eyes when you see some of these leaders, but... Uh, <laughs> But uh, that is just the nature of things, and it's actually so, w whenever we see good leadership, we should be so grateful for that, and we should strive ourselves to be good leaders. Uh, remember, you are good leaders, not so much in your words, uh, but in how you are telling what other people to do, but you are a good leader in your example to other people. That is the real leadership in this life, uh, and this is what we need more of. Uh, and uh, sometimes that's why we have to turn to, you know, good religious institutions to people like the Buddha, because sometimes the, uh, in the world we don't actually find the kind of quality of people that we would like to find. Uh, sometimes we have to turn to things like Buddhism to actually find those things. Uh, that's why we have it. When, great king, you dwell diligently with diligence for your support, uh, you will be guarded and protected. Uh, your retinue of harem women will be guarded and protected. Uh, your treasury and storehouse will be guarded and protected. Uh, so um, uh, so this, this is kind of the, the worldly side of things, yeah? Uh, your possessions will be guarded and protected uh, if you live well. Uh, and uh, so that is comes in handy, huh, doesn't it? Huh? Comes in, you know. Huh? You there's no point in in, uh, in in wasting things. Huh? So it's good that everything is guarded in this particular way. Huh? So there's always that balance between spiritual qualities here and and the worldly qualities. Huh? You see the Buddha encouraging you in a spiritual way, but also encouraging you from a more worldly perspective as well. Huh? Because that is the reality for most people's life. It is a mixture of the worldly and the spiritual. Huh? Anyway, that is the last sutta uh, of the Buddha, between the Buddha and King Pasenadi. This is just like a little warm-up. Yeah? Now it becomes the more serious stuff after this. Uh, so now, we, from now on, no more smiles, and now we're going to get serious. Uh, <laughs> no, that's, that's, an, that's just another joke. Yeah. 
So uh, let's have a short break, 15 minutes or so, and we'll see you back again at a quarter to three here.